Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Conversations with QB, the Earth Day edition. Happy Earth Month to everyone. Um, uh, we're still hopefully waiting for a few more people to uh, jump in, but I thought we could go ahead and, and get started with some of the logistics. Um, we'll, we obviously have Councilmember Lauren QB with us, and uh, and uh, Richard Atkins, our, our urban forester, will be talking about trees. We have uh, Kendon Young from the Sustainability Commission and Sustainability Director Braden Kay will be with us a little bit later. Um, so as we go along, folks will be chatting about a few different things. If you have questions for anybody that's on the panel here, um, please enter them in the chat um, and we will make sure that those uh, that those questions get answered. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Council Member Lauren Cuby. Thank you, Kristen. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. It's it's Earth Day Eve. We all know in, at ASU we celebrate Earth Month, maybe Earth Year. Tomorrow's Earth Day, and now it's Earth Day Eve. So I'm really glad to have this. Every year we kind of like to reconvene and see where we're headed as a city, what we can do better, what we're doing now. And I am so delighted to have the group, the panel that I have today. And first off is Kendon Young, and I've known Kendon since 2014, I believe, when I first ran for office, I knocked on his door and uh, Kendon graduated with a, a BA in sustainable urban dynamics the year before, and then he got a master's in higher and post-secondary education in 2016. I was so struck by his level of knowledge and he's such a young person and had came equipped with so many skills and talents and, and passions for sustainability. So in 2015, when we first formed the Sustainability Commission, I could think of no one better to appoint. He was one of the first people that we appointed to the commission. He's now the chair of that commission. So if you run into him, you should call him commissioner and not Kendon. But um, he's worked as a thought leader across the spectrum of sustainability. And he's currently getting his PhD as he just can't stop with those degrees in design, environment, and the arts at ASU, of course. And he's been at the forefront of desert water policy, global corporate social impact, urban resiliency, and worked for three nationally recognized research centers. And he has such experience with local businesses, uh, not just on the commission, but in his work at ASU, nonprofits, public agencies, and um, all in, in to achieve sustainability goals. He is passionate, he is determined, he is uh, what is best in my mind about Tempe. And I'd like to just give that over, give the stage over to, to Kendon, who can update us on, on the Sustainability Commission, what it's like to serve, what it's like to be commissioner, and whatever else you want to talk about tonight, Kendon. Well, thank you, Lauren. Uh, I feel like you're gassing me up or <laughs> charging me up. That's right. Um, well, it's a pleasure to chat with everyone tonight. Um, I, I'm very excited to share with you the perspective of uh, my own experience uh, here uh, in Tempe, pushing sustainability uh, through our uh, city is able to impact the lives of others, um, as well as how the Sustainability Commission, which is a, a, a group of the public that informs our uh, city government on priorities um, that we think will better the outcome of Tempe. Um, so with that said, um, I'm not sure how many of you uh, know what a commission or a board is. Uh, but uh, there are many commissions and boards for the city that you can apply to as a resident or as a um, uh, business owner in Tempe, whatever the criteria are, um, to sit with like-minded, passionate individuals like yourselves and uh, think about ways that we can improve the city in different areas. The Sustainability Commission is one, but there's others, including the Parks and Rec, uh, advisory Commission, the Neighborhood Advisory Commissions, the Disability and Accessibility uh, Commission. Um, so in the Sustainability Commission, we look at uh, a whole myriad of things. I think there's about 17 different focus areas <laughs> um, that we oversee. Um, but for us, uh, we were really passionate about getting the ball rolling and getting action started. So back in 2000 and uh, 15, uh, when we were getting started, our goals were to figure out what goals should be. Um, and long story short, we are now, um, as a city, at a place where we have adopted a climate action plan. 
So this is a series of 12 actions that are grouped in three focus areas, which include, uh, or I'm sorry, four uh, focus areas, ex extreme heat, energy resilience, transportation, and um, of course I'm forgetting the last one. Sorry, y'all, it's been a long day. <laughs> um, but uh, so these, uh, these areas that we have been focusing on all include different actions that improve the quality and resilience and uh, vibrantness of our city. Um, so uh, how many of you all have seen, go, go ahead and chat or enter it into the chat. Um, how many of you have seen uh, Tempe's climate action plan? Maybe like two seconds to uh, throw it in there. Um, but um, our first one was adopted back in uh, 2020. Uh, the 12 actions that we were really uh, pushing for um, ranged the gambit of uh, in expanding access to EV charging stations, of putting in resilient uh, uh, resiliency hubs. So these are areas that um, uh, neighborhoods in uh, extreme weather conditions that lose power are able to navigate to and get the, the resources that they need. Uh, we've also been looking at how to make our city uh, more multimodal. So that's uh, the whole gambit of different uh, ways in which you can traverse through, um, through the city, including bike, light rail, uh, skateboards, cars, carpool, uh, the streetcar, all of these are, are part of it. Um, but I think something that's really worth noting is that sustainability, even though everyone thinks of uh, the environment and uh, recycling, is so much more than that. It is the, the way in which we design our programs, our projects, our policies that benefit the environment, our economy, and um, our society. So it's that triple bottom line so, uh, that improves the outcomes for all. And that has been something that's very uh, challenging to uh, build within our city uh, and our community because it's seen as a zero sum game. Either you are being sustainable or you are doing other things. If we were actually, it, if we are doing sustainability, we're doing both of those at the same time, not one or the other. So that's a very important element that we on the commission really strive for. Um, now, uh, with that, uh, awesome. I'm so glad to see that many of you have seen the climate action plan. Um, so uh, with the commission and one of the things that we've worked on is um, uh, with the adoption of the climate action plan has been pushing its engagement and working with different uh, stakeholder groups like the youth population, um, the um, religious community, the business community, the, um, the nonprofits, all of these types of folks to bring in unique, creative, amazing ideas so that this plan is completely and holistically reflective of our community. And that's been something that we have been very passionate about pushing from the get-go. We are now in a, a stage where we are updating the climate action plan. The first one was kind of our, you know, baby train, training wheels, get our, our legs underneath us, get some confidence built, get some wins uh, pushed. And now we're uh, building on those successes. And the last thing that I'll add is, uh, so that, that has been our priority for the last year and a half, two years. And, uh, and we do that by uh, working with these community groups to get engaged. We also work with the commissioners. So we've had, or I'm sorry, the, the city council members. So we've uh, had conversations with them to figure out, you know, what are their priorities? How does sustainability manifest in those uh, priorities? And how can our, our um, priorities strengthen theirs? And um, how do we do this in a way that re retains the unique an incredibly uh, special culture that is Tempe and to do do this in a way that only feels Tempe. Um, so I know I'm kind of uh, going all over the place here, um, but that's a, a pretty high level overview. Um, and I wanna thank Lauren for inviting me to speak today.
Well, thanks. I could start the conversation going by asking some questions. So, um, what do you think has been the, the the biggest success of the commission? Maybe you know something in the climate action plan that's gone from concept to reality. What what do you think is what do you hang your hat on as a commission? Absolutely. Um, one of our early wins um, that we were really proud of is that at the onset we were really dedicated to setting baselines. And part of that was uh, advocating for the city of Tempe to sign on to the Global Covenant of Mayors, uh, which worked on or which worked towards establishing a greenhouse gas emissions inventory. So that was, that was the first thing that our advocacy helped contribute to that we were stoked about. Leading or uh, dovetailing off of that, um, as members of the public and uh, not staff per se, uh, we needed help to in order uh, for uh, for that task to be accomplished. So, uh, with uh, the incredible leadership of uh, Councilperson uh, Lauren Kuby, as well as the immense knowledge that is uh, at ASU. We were able to establish a, a position, uh, which was a manager uh, for sustainability, Braden Kay, who has now been promoted to our director. Um, uh, that was the second big win to then start going after pilots, uh, complete the greenhouse gas emissions and figure out where we are at and uh, validate the proof of concept of why we should keep this. And third, um, that's really, uh, and so that was our evolution and our growing up, if you will, to, to tackle bigger and better things. And the last part in, and this tactile application of our role has really been a bringing in the community into the development of a climate action plan. And I can tell you that through my three years, uh, the past three years where we were really heavily invested in this engagement, um, that it was incredibly rewarding to be going into these community spaces and saying uh, and, and asking people, you know, please tell us what, what is it that you want to see? How can this government be of service to you and improve your community? And that, tac uh, that was uh, something that we really held dear as a, um, even though an intangible, if you will, um, you kind of had to be there to see it. <laughs> Um, but really spoke to the end result of the climate action plan. And personally, I, I get a lot of uh, joy seeing people interact and get excited about sustainability. So that was really fulfilling for me. Well, yeah, I love attending the meetings. I learn a lot. It's hard for me to not butt in sometimes. Uh, and as you know, you have to like, hold on, Lauren, this isn't your meeting. Um, but you meet on, tell people when you meet and how, how you engage with the public during your meetings. Absolutely. So we meet on the third Tuesday of the month, which uh, in the last year we have transitioned to uh, the digital format. So anyone from anywhere uh, can join the meetings and we structure our meetings to talk about um, each of the major areas of the climate action plan and how either we can do more to improve it or we can include more folks to be part of its uh, conceptualization. So uh, we just had our, our um, April meeting this week, actually. Um, so May will be our next one. And if you go to, if you Google Sustainability uh, Commission City of Tempe, will be the first link that pops up and we'd be happy to welcome anyone that wants to join. And you have time for public comment at the beginning of the meeting, I know, and then- Oh. <laughs> Yes, thank you. So it, with any commission, actually, you can go and uh, there's approximately 10 minutes uh, ish, but uh, any member of the public can address the commission, bring up questions uh, or concerns that they have uh, in approximately three minutes. And then we will uh, follow up with you after the fact uh, to help with your idea, as well as um, invite you to sit in on the rest of the commission meeting and hear uh, what else we have on the agenda. I noticed um, with the first climate action plan, there was so much engagement and at ASU especially, I remember being at one meeting, there were a hundred people there and climate plan 2.0, there are different meetings with uh, faith-based groups and younger people and social justice groups and you know a lot of different groups weighing in. 
And it was really striking to me because one of the recommendations that came out of, of, of the Climate Action Plan 2.0 still being investigated, one of the actions that came out is that the social justice group said, you shouldn't necessarily be the ones always hosting the meetings. Let a social justice group host the meeting on their own turf where people might feel more free to say what they want than they might when it's a city organized event. Can you talk about that and, and our relationship with CHISPA and groups like Unlimited Potential? Absolutely, and this came out, um, and you hit the nail right on the head. We are facilitators of a larger discussion, but by no means are we uh, directing the outcome of those specific conversations. And so our role um, in establishing a, a commissioner representative, so uh, currently on the commission, we have uh, commissioners that uh, are liaisons to youth groups. We have a commissioner that is a liaison to the business community, that is a liaison to um, the uh, climate justice organizations. And our objective in this, um, and you bring up CHISPA um, as a fantastic example, is saying, like, uh, sustainability is a predominantly uh, white space. So, like, we want to get away from that. We want to be more inclusive. And what better way than to have these uh, community organizations spark that uh, conversation, bring up all that wonderful, rich information and, and interests and desires um, to then help fill out the climate action plan. Because that's the only way that our climate action plan will be reflective of our community and uh, be able to benefit all of our community members. So true, it's especially true during COVID times because we it's harder to have public engagement. Everyone's getting tired of WebEx and, and Zoom and all the rest. And so we have less people attending our meetings or if they are, they're kind of through the screen and we don't necessarily get to engage with them one-on-one. -on -one. It's just they make a statement and kind of leave the space. So it's especially important because when I think about decisions we make as a council really impact generations, generations a lot, a lot younger than me, and they impact people that aren't necessarily present at the meetings, even when those meetings are in, you know, in person. Often when we have meetings in person, it's people who have economic interests before the council, like land use attorneys who are there, a lot of staff, but a lot of people with economic interests and someone who's who works and maybe holds two jobs or is going to school and balancing life and, and family may not have time to go to a council meeting. So it's important to, to go to where people are. And that's the point that Chispa was making to us so strongly. Uh, what about the Dolores Square Today training you actually uh, conducted uh, along with you guys advised on that and Braden K, Dr. K led that effort, but we worked with unlimited potential in Chispa to have climate justice and youth activism training on Dolores Square Today. So tell us about that. <laughs> I'm throwing well, it, was, it was a fantastic uh, initiative that our very own Anna Mellis uh, was part of. And uh, for those of you that don't know, the breakup of our commission includes um, a undergraduate or a, a, a student that is attending um, or lives uh, attending school or lives in Tempe, a graduate student that attends or lives in Tempe. Uh, business members, uh, a faith-based or representative, a uh, scientist, a resident, a member at large. We have all of these different categories. And Anna Mellis, who has been uh, a fantastic young emerging leader, uh, I shouldn't say young, emerging leader, uh, has uh, been part of the this particular initiative that looks at how we mobilize people, how we create inclusive conversations and still push the needle um, in uh, positive ways. So uh, Kristen, do we have any questions? Or should I keep on with this process? You guys, usually we meet, um, we meet at the library. I miss so much meeting in person with folks. Uh, and hopefully sooner, sooner than later, we'll meet again in person. And most times it's, we're open to discussion about any issue. And of course, it, towards the end, we're, we're happy to open up the field of questions. But for now, we want to focus on sustainability, our efforts that way, climate action plan, the budget that we're currently in the process of uh, composing and how the budget will reflect our climate action plan. But happy to take any questions or I can keep asking questions myself.
There aren't any questions in the chat. You guys are welcome to put questions in the chat if you want to. Um, David Sokolowski has his hand raised, so I'm just mm -hmm. gonna go ahead and unmute him so he can ask his own question. Very good. Go Hi, ahead, David. Everyone. Hi, I thought this would be an interesting time to talk about. Um, we just voted on a bike hero for Melissa Mahone, who was working with the Welcome to America project. Oh. And you were talking about um, working with outreach. And so I thought this was interesting because maybe there are ways the sustainability commission and, and department could work with not only refugees, but just people who are moving to our community in general so that when they arrive here, you know, they can kind of be introduced to maybe how they could improve their lifestyle through sustainability. Because actually after a person moves, that's when it's people are most likely to change their habits. So moving to a new community can kind of be like the perfect time to say, hey, let's let's pick up new habits, let's recycle, let's bike, and all these other things. A fantastic point, David, um, and goes to a psychological um, grounding in, I think it's called temporal landmarks. So when you are changing your environment, um, all of the behaviors and routines that you've ascribed to that space are being changed and uh, is oftentimes in the way that we think about our past selves, our uh, new segments. Um, it's fantastic. I would highly encourage you if you haven't seen it uh, to look into the consumer marketing space. They, you, you see a lot of examples of this and like, oh, new year, new you, like sign up for a gym membership. <laughs> uh, the same thing happens um, with physical changes. Um, and uh, your point about uh, refugees, I, I know that we have been really um, focused on the resilient energy hub as a, a tactic to bring access to reliable energy in our communities when uh, there's extreme weather events that knock out the power uh, so that we can continue to provide resources to um, more at-risk members of our community. And so uh, dovetailing uh, with this uh, with your comment about the refugee, I think is a fantastic thing for us to explore and figure out how we can, again, continue to uh, meet the needs of our community in a way that is totally and uh, uniquely Tempe. And the Welcome to America project, they're doing such good work and they're in Tempe and they, they've helped so many asylees and refugees acclimate and become um, comfortable in this new place we call <laughs> Tempe or Arizona or the US. And, you know, the American Recovery Act and Joe Biden's plan, it allows for direct, um, direct resources to be given to asylees, to the undocumented. Previously, that was not allowed. Money would go to uh, an outside agency or our CAP agency, TCAA, and, and they could indirectly assist people, but we couldn't as a city provide housing assistance or utility assistance from our own stock of funding. So that's changed with this administration. I really welcome that change because the asylee refugee and undocumented community um, who can often be in the shadows are really suffering in these COVID times. And when one person in our community suffers, we all suffer. So it's it's so important that we've had that change in mindset about aid and resources. So any other questions? And I'm wondering, Kenan, do you wanna hang on for the entire length of the uh, event? Because when we have Richard Atkins speak about urban forestry or Braden speak, you might be a good resource as more questions come in, but I understand you have, uh, it's Earth Earth Day Eve, and so you might be having celebrations <laughs> somewhere. I'm happy to hang on. <laughs> Very good. What What is the main focus now of the commission? Would you say that most um, the most interested uh, uh, sort of topic right now? Absolutely. Um, so our current priorities are uh, to pass the Climate Action Plan 2.0 version, the expanded uh, version. Uh, we are also, we just finished uh, nominating all of the wonderful, incredible residents and businesses and nonprofits for in, uh, sustainability work uh, that um, many of you might have seen in the neighborhood uh, awards uh, ceremony that was, uh, I think, last Saturday. Um, so that was a fantastic effort. And uh, looking ahead, one of the things that we are really interested in is weighing in on the accelerated budget uh, that the council will be working on, uh, or that will be passing in the near future to ensure that climate uh, neutrality is uh, a priority in the way that we spend our money that benefits 
other projects and not just sustainability, but uh, pushing that forward, as well as um, uh, one that you may be seeing a lot or one of our highlight items that we're interested in uh, is expanding access to uh, EV uh, charging stations that has been taking a lot of traction lately and we're really excited about um, where that can move the city and move uh, the valley in terms of its resilience. Um, and then the last thing that I'm particularly excited about, oh my gosh, no, I just lost it. Where is it? No, 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 no. Oh, you'll have to come back to me. Electrification of our fleet. <laughs> yeah. That is definitely part of the EV charging, um, which I'm excited about and shows how the city is walking the talk as well as helping uh, our community members. I know Maybe. we lead amongst 20 cities in Arizona in adoption of electric vehicles and mm -hmm. it wasn't a directive from the council that was our fleet manager just understanding and believing in the culture of the city and taking that upon himself and recognizing that maintenance operation costs were so much less he was saving money so he thought this makes a lot of sense <laughs> um, but we should actually probably move on to Richard Atkins because we um, have a lot to cover tonight so if you want to hang on if you don't I understand but um Kenny, you know how much we value your expertise and your your uh, sometimes when people say your passion, I always feel like, wait, that's a diminutive, you know, passion and expertise go together. And that combination that is not that is so unique and is so needed because we need to have the will and the political will to really respond to this climate crisis. So thanks so much for all that you are and serving as our commissioner. And I'm sorry if I sometimes see you and I call you Kendon and not commissioner. And you never say I'm a commissioner net no you never <laughs> ceremony. But thanks so much, Kendon. And we'll probably be talking to you later. Sounds good. Now I would like to welcome Richard Atkins. He's our urban forester for the city of Tempe. It's a position we created just, I think is it two years ago, Richard? Uh maybe two years ago. A year and nine months. <laughs> and um before that, he was a forestry supervisor at the city of Phoenix, and we snatched him away. And we were so glad he did because he brings such a wealth of knowledge about trees, tree canopy, we, we've committed to doubling our, our trees and our shade in Tempe by 2040, you know, from 13% to 25%, uh, 26%. And uh, you can correct me on that percentage, I think I'm wrong. But uh, you came with such a wealth of knowledge. I know you were also at Gilbert. You were the consulting arborist for Gilbert. You have a master of mm -hmm. forestry from Utah State and a bachelor's in resource management from Virginia Tech. And so I'm so glad that you're here tonight. We we have a lot of questions about what's going on with trees. We're all worried about what this summer might bring to our tree canopy. We're excited about the budget and that it seems like you're gonna be funded well. We also have, we also have oops, oops. seem to be seem to be echoing. I will just shut up and shut up and Okay, I'll, yeah, so I'll, I'll go from there. Well, thank yeah. you, Council yeah. Member Kirby. I appreciate the introduction. Um, and yes, tomorrow is Earth Day, and don't forget Arbor Day is next Friday. That often gets overshadowed. So, you know, I like to play Arbor Day just as much. It's a much older event, so I want everybody to remember that. So something that I was just going to talk about a few moments, I made some notes for like protecting our trees as the summer approaches. I mean, like with Earth Day tomorrow and Arbor Day approaching, seems like talking about trees is an important topic. Um, you want to remember last year was very challenging. I mean, we had 53 days over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. 11 of those were continuously straight days, many of which were over 115. Um, and the high temperatures followed us into October with even mid 90 degree temperatures into November. And then you look at the first 13 days of April this year, they were already above 90. Uh, so, you know, we do live in the Sonoran Desert, so we do expect some heat, but it's this extended duration that really affects our plants and trees. And when you add the hot, dry winds that we experience around midsummer in July and the minimal precipitation rates that we're receiving, I mean, care for our trees and plants does become difficult and something we really have to put our attention to. So just a few points on some preparation. I'm gonna say the best preparation is good plant health. 
Um, and this comes from a favorable growing environment. Now, I've spoken in the past many times about the right tree in the right place. Um, this is something that I always want to emphasize when you're choosing a species and location for planting a tree at your property. And I do the same here for the city. Because we want our trees to be a benefit and an asset to our property and not become a liability over time. So a favorable environment starts with making sure that we have appropriate and adequate space for the tree to grow. For one, this limits the need for unnecessary or excessive pruning to make the tree fit the space that we have planted it into, but as well as it provides space both underground and above ground for the tree to grow and reach its genetic potential. So with that, a good soil environment is probably the most important. Um, I mean, we do have heat, and as you know, it's a dry heat because our humidity is so low. And we have that, like I said, this continuous duration of really high temperatures we're experiencing that can cause a water deficit within the plant, which stresses the plant material and the cells and can create problems going forward. Because as we all know, a large percentage of the water that transpires through a tree is basically used just to cool the tree off to make sure there's a good growing environment and everything is at a proper temperature for the tree to grow. And so the more cooling that is needed, the tree is pulling up more water and sometimes it uses more water than what we can absorb or what the soil is able to provide. So when this happens for an extended period, the tree reaches a point, um, sometimes of no return, of where we have start to have um, cell destruction and tissue loss, and the tree starts to decline and be overstressed. So if I want to go back to the soil environment for a moment, because we want to work to maintain good soil moisture, it's extremely important. But it's also the well hydrated and aerated soil that is probably some of our best preparation. Because as we all know, roots need not only water, but they need oxygen in order to be healthy and to grow. So we're looking at a homogeneous soil moisture regime around the root zone of our trees to help provide that need. And we wanna manage this irrigation. Sometimes we have to adjust the volume and the frequency. I mean, we're all about water conservation and I think we can conserve water, but we just need to manage our water. And sometimes during those hot summer months, we might have to increase that frequency and maybe a little bit longer duration. Now, I'm not talking about turning the hose on in June and not turning it off into September. Um, we need to manage it, like I said, because we can create an anaerobic condition uh, by putting down too much water, and that can be just as bad as not having enough, because like I said, the soil, the roots need oxygen as well to grow. So we need to just manage that, and you need to be able to check your soil moisture. Um, maybe a metal probe is what I use, or a very long, a long screwdriver that you can get down, you know, six to eight inches into the soil to give you a good idea of what the moisture is down in there. It's always good to have the top one or two inches to dry out a little bit, and that, you know, gives that chance for oxygenation to go down into the soil and to help feed the roots. So, soil moisture, number one preparation. So with that, I wanna to add to mulch. Um, I'm a very big proponent of some composted mulch around my plants and trees. Um, a couple of things, it helps conserve the moisture. So, you know, once you get that moisture up in the soil, because I, have, um, I didn't mention earlier, it's hard to play catch up. If we let the soil go completely dry and it's like July and oh my gosh, I'm gonna to have to put some water on these plants. It's very challenging and difficult to bring that soil moisture back up to where the tree is just not constantly using it all the time and you're constantly putting water down all the time. So now is a good time to start building up our soil moisture. And the mulch really helps to maintain that moisture in there and holds it in the soil as well as it can buffer the soil temperatures often between 10 to 20 degrees. So if you have some feeder roots that might be near the surface, and that kind of buffers that soil temperature so the roots still have a favorable environment to grow. 
I like the chunky composted mulch, um, what is often referred to as number twos. Um, we have that here in Tempe that is being made. Um, you put a nice uh, two to four inches over the root zones, not piling it against the trunk by any means, but yeah, over the root zone can really help keep that temperature down as well as help keep the soil moist. So we've talked about soil moisture a lot and some mulch. I want to go into pruning just for a moment because everybody wants to prune their trees for the monsoon. Okay. For your non-native and your thin bark trees, you really want to try to avoid pruning them during the summer. Um, it just creates unnecessary stress and opens the opportunity for sun scald to these trees. Now, conversely, you have your natives like your mesquites, your palo verdes, um, your ironwoods, they have different adaptive strategies. So it's kind of nice to prune them during the summer. They'll actually hold their prune better. Um, they seem to respond and seal the wounding much better. So I have no problem with pruning the natives during that time, just as long as they're not over pruned. And that gets back to the pruning so the wind blows through. That's what I often hear coming up this time of year. Well, trees have a natural dampening effect. Their trees, the, the structure of the crown is built that way. So the trees move with the wind. So if we remove too much of the interior vegetation, um, so the wind can blow through per se, we end up having heavy growth out on the ends of branches and those can act as levers and the wind will catch those and often create more damage than if the tree was not pruned at all. Now, if there's, of course, some heavy growth or there's a broken or dead branch or something, please, we know that needs to be pruned. But what I'm talking about is a full pruning of the crown. And if it's not a native tree and it's a, a non-native or any of our fruit trees, that's really something we want to avoid in the summertime. And if you do any pruning, a good watering thereafter is extremely important. Because, I mean, the trees use foliage to protect themselves. It's just like us wearing a long sleeve shirt or a hat when we go out in the sun to protect our skin. The trees are using foliage to protect some of the inner bark. So we, by removing that, it, does, it creates opportunities for sun scald on some of the younger tissue, as well as it makes it difficult for the tree to actually transpire and pull that water back up through the crown to help cool it off. So just something I want you to be aware of. So we talked about some soil moisture, the importance of mulch, the very much in the importance of not over pruning. And, but then finally, I wanna consider protecting our young trees. You know, trees that you recently planted over this winter. Perhaps many of you planted some fruit trees. I know I did at my house. So as this heat and this intense solar radiation starts to come on, um, shade cloths, sometimes on the western exposure of our young trees, that would be a good idea. You can build like a, a little shade structure, especially on the west side to help protect the new growth and the, um, the young bark. Wrapping the trunks with some tree wrap available at most of the nurseries um, is it also a good idea to help protect the trunk? You want to wrap it loosely though, not very tight, because you still want air to get through in there and um, circulate around the trunk. Um, creating cardboard um, tubes is also a very good idea. I do that with all of my citrus. Um, the young citrus, you can just cut you a cardboard tube, tape it together so it loosely just kind of sits around the trunk and that helps protect it again from that solar radiation. And of course, whitewash or light colored latex paint that you thinned out with water provides the exact same protection from sun scald. And so with that, um, we're about as prepared as we're going to be as the summer approaches. So I trust, you know, everyone stays safe and then we can work together to endure the summer and help protect our trees as well. So with that, I say thank you and happy if there's any questions. Richard, we have a couple Richard, of questions. Oh, now I'm echoing. Now I'm echoing. I'm gonna say that's you, say Richard. That's you, You're Richard. the common denominator the common between denominator me and Lauren. So am I <laughs> echoing as well? No. <laughs> oh, okay. 
All right. Well, I, you know, I'll, I'll take as much responsibility as I need. <laughs> uh, Jim Hartman would like to know. He says, I'm concerned that my aging citrus trees use too much water. The current Tempe information really pushes desert trees. Are citrus still encouraged? That's a good question. Um, one of the seas of which Arizona was founded is indeed citrus. Um, we have a legacy of citrus. If you know a lot of the history of the citrus, why Arizona really got into growing citrus because we were putting out two crops to every one of California back in the day around the turn of the century. So we were getting more trees to the east, uh, more fruit to the eastern markets. So Arizona became known as a big citrus region. Um, older trees are starting to decline. That's true. A lot of the older citrus, and I'm saying when I say older, I'm talking 65 years plus. Um, they're not quite as productive as they used to be. And yes, citrus does use a lot of water, but it depends on your management of that water. It's best to flood the area around the citrus, let that dry out, and then flood it again. Um, I have citrus trees that I, mean, I manage them well on as a little water as I can. I still get very good fruit crops. Will I say is it still encouraged? I mean, water conservation is an uh, important priority, but also is growing our tree canopy and props of providing food. If you are growing food crop in your backyard and you have a number of trees there that can work together in a guild and provide shade on each other and use the same water resources, I'm going to say that's still a good idea to grow fruit trees here in the desert. Let's see if I echo. Can you try and mute speaking, Richard? Maybe that will help. Okay, let me see. Okay, oh, it seems to work. Um, yeah, question about mesquite. When I worked on the long-term ecological research project, CAP LTR, and, and at ASU, it seemed I had one preliminary finding, and I'm not sure if it, it held, but what it said was that the people tend to overwater drought resistant trees and that those trees like mesquite will take up all the water they'll love it and they'll produce a lot more biomass but that's not necessarily a healthy way for a tree to grow you know just producing lots of biomass so that people tend to overwater drought resistant trees can you speak to that issue uh indeed and, that, and that's a extremely excellent point people do tend to overwater and that's what i mentioned it's all about water management you got to manage it through the different times of the year, the different periods of the um, climate. So, yes, um, a mesquite tree is going to take as much water as you want to dump on it and pull up a chair in the summertime and just watch it grow. Um, they do not need as much water. I would perhaps, if I saw a mesquite trying starting to stress, maybe give it one watering during the summertime and I would let it be. Now that's in say a residential yard experience. Now, if you have a mesquite tree that's sitting in a four by four cutout in the middle of a shopping mall parking lot, no, that's, that's a whole different thing. And there's gonna have to be some supplementary irrigation for that tree in order for it to even try to survive. But yes, the, the Palo Verdes, your ironwoods, your mesquites, your sweet acacias even, um, we tend to overwater them or not water them properly. The irrigation emitters or the flood bubbler is still sitting there right by the mesquite trunk, um, absolutely doing nothing but wasting water and perhaps creating disease potential around the root base of the tree. So it's very important to just manage that water resource that we have with our urban canopy resource so we can grow together. Thank you. Oh, let's see, is there any echo? No. Yes, you, sorry, thank you for meeting. Can you also talk about attrition? We always hear that, uh, you know, attrition, the trees will have a natural evolution, so you can't expect every tree to live forever. And we have, I think, 200 plus 
trees that sort of die in Tempe every year, I think. Maybe you can correct me. But what about attrition versus disease and infestation of bark beetles? We know that with climate change, we're having more infestation of pests, correct? And so can you talk about the infestation issue, especially as it relates to pine trees in Tempe, which is what I hear about from residents? Okay, good point. Um, yeah, natural attrition, we, I figure about 2% of our entire population each year due to just natural senescence, um, vandalism, storm damage, what have you. And so, you know, we're looking at probably about two, 300 trees a year. And that's kind of what I'm planning on when I'm doing my planting plans. But as far as our, our disease and pests are really actually quite small instances here in the valley, basically because it is so dry. Um, we don't have a lot of fungus problems. That's where the overwatering actually comes in. Um, that can lead to more of our, our path pathological problems with the trees. Um, a lot with the pines though, we, there is an instance, there is a new pine beetle pest that we are tracking the population of here in the valley. It is a Mediterranean pine engraver. It's not the same as the bark beetles that you will find up, uh, you know, on the rim up in the Flagstaff or Payson area that um, it's a, a different kind of bark beetle engraver, as I say, and we're finding that it will attack some of our stressed pines. Now, pines are heavy water users. Um, we still do plant some of them. Um, if you maintain and manage their water correctly, I think it is still an okay species to have, as long as we're not, they're not too much of our population. Um, you got to remember that most of the pines we have here, all of the pines, are Mediterranean species. So if you think about that, they want a lot of moisture in the winter time, and that's when we turn off all of our water generally, you know, or turn down our water, or most homeowners do. And pines having a good charge of water in the winter time to keep that soil moisture high, that's extremely important for the pines. Um, there's the flathead borers that you see a lot of the pines that are already dead when people are going to them now, the bark's starting to peel off, and you see these big galleries, and oh my gosh, the borers killed my tree. Um, mostly all of those are secondary. The tree has already been stressed either with insufficient root zone or poor root development, not enough ir irrigation or soil man uh, moisture management, and the tree is already in decline. And once that pine goes in decline and starts to die, those secondary um, borers will come in there and they will just take care of the rest of it for us. Mine's in decline. That's a good one. Um, yeah, Kevin Brown had a question, and and Kristen, can you um, unmute him? Because he asked, "What is the problem with the high lows, ninety or more for a low?" And I think he's getting to the urban heat island effect, if I'm not mistaken. But Kevin, do we get there, Kevin, do we get there? with your question? Mm, I think Kevin has actually left the meeting. Okie doke. He's not on the list. Well, I can address the question. The basically thing with the high lows, and I was talking about with the plants transpiring, it doesn't give the tree a break. Um, we get regular low temperatures. You know, trees like to grow in, in the 80s, 70s, and 80 degrees are optimal cellular responses and optimal growth temperatures. So when you have, you know, the nighttime temperatures as they get into the mid 90s, it, the tree never gets a chance to rest. It is constantly respiring and transpiring. So pulling that moisture through. That's what perhaps Mr. Brown's talking about, but I mean, that's a big issue. We don't get the chance to cool off. It's that extended duration of temperature and um, that just causes more issues. Thank you. I know that in um, Daly Park, a few years ago, they planted a number of peach trees. They hoped to have a, a peach grove, and there was hopes that they could have a peach pie contest event. And, you know, really, they realized peach trees use a lot of water, but they thought, well, what better use of water than to create community? You know, there's always trade-offs with water use. And 
as I bike by there, I, I see that the peaches are not doing well. I don't know if you're aware of the situation in Delhi Park that's getting into a little too, maybe too specific. Can you talk about that when we plant peach, peach trees and maybe even pecan trees and how they are suited or not suited to our environment? Um, exactly. It kind of goes back to the, the first question. Um, we can grow fruit here. I mean, food does grow on trees. And I think having a food forest for a lot of our community is an important thing, but you do have the trade off of maintaining it and providing water for it. Um, the trees there, from my understanding, I was not here when they were planted. I mean, you think about where they are, they are on the western exposure of the park. There is absolutely no shade or relief from that western sun that's coming in on those trees. So they were really not protected when they were first put in. There is some sun scalding that I have seen on there. Um, I think mulch would be a good addition around there, as well as we just got to really make sure that we keep up on the water. And if we have any type of irrigation issues or something, we have to find a way to supplement those. Um, they just need a lot more care than perhaps a you know, municipal park situation can provide. So Richard, you are a profoundly good communicator and not just with events like this, but you you host a lot of uh, sort of webinars or or events, Zoom events. It used to be sometimes in person. Tell us about what opportunities uh, our residents have to learn more about pruning, planting, and watering their trees. And tell us about the tree bait. The tree bait. All right. Well, thank you. No, it's a good prompt. Um, we do. I work with water conservation. And um, we have done a number of educational seminars, workshops so far. Of course, they've all been online this year. I'm really looking forward to the time that I can get back with residents and we can get out and you know plant trees and look at the roots and talk about soil moisture and be right there, you know, getting our hands dirty. I mean, Arbor Day is next week. I'm doing a couple of planting events, but really not really having the public. We're just not to that point yet. Um, all of those videos are available online. You can watch, we have one on species selection on to where you want to plant and the considerations that you need around your property. Um, we have proper pruning. We also just did one um, just at the beginning of April on proper planting and planting technique so that your tree can become that asset that we talked about and not the liability that we don't want. Um, all those are available at the water conservation website. And as far as the tree bait program right now, within, within water conservation, you can get up to, I believe it's $75 rebate on desert plants, water conserving plants, um, drought tolerant trees that you plant on your property. So that's something I, I would, um, ask everybody to go to the water conservation site, water conservation Tempe. And um, a lot of information there and you can contact them. Extremely helpful. They can help you with water audits, check your irrigation, see if there's problems, see if you've got a leak and provide you a lot of good information. I work very closely with them. So I know that uh, residents have opportunities to have free trees through SRP. I believe APS has a similar program. I'm not sure. Uh, and then through neighborhoods, neighbor grants, uh, we we often plant trees and, and it used to be we didn't allow trees planted in private property to be um, allowed with neighborhood grant, the Marion Quarter grant program. But then people like you realize, wait, if we're planting trees on and they have a benefit of giving shade to the sidewalk, that's a good thing for the community. So we see a lot of tree planting going on. Tell us like if, if, if assuming the budget goes as we expected, um, what will you be doing with your with your budget? What kind of plans do you have? For the next fiscal year, assuming everything goes according to plan. <laughs> That's interesting. You're asking me to put all of my cards on the table. I'm trying to save a couple of things. I will say I'm very excited about the possible budget process. So with that right there. Um, well, I'm trying to go to get a more proactive maintenance program going, especially for the city maintained trees. I mean, you grow canopy two ways. That's one is planting new trees, but you also need to maintain the older mature trees that we have. 
and we need to have the funds to also care for these young trees so that they will grow into that next cohort. So that's really what I'm looking for with um, coming up this year. And then we're working with a lot of neighborhoods on grant opportunities. They've extended, you know, tree planting opportunities on private property, like you were talking about. And um, so working, I get talk with neighborhoods and residents almost daily uh, about species choices, what for this neighborhood, what for this property, what, and I'm going to save my surprise. So I got coming in the fall. I'm looking at a new tree program to work with private residents in the city of Tempe, but I don't want to let that out of the bag quite yet because I'm still working out through all of those details. But there are trees available with SRP. APS no longer has their program functioning, but um, with Trees Matter and um, SRP, they often, um, Trees Matter often holds those tree um, giveaway events at the Tempe Library. So it's very convenient for um, Tempe residents to participate in. And what about commercial businesses? We know that when a development is established, there are requirements for landscaping that the city puts down and then time, <laughs> time goes on and then we see some plants die or trees die and they're not really kept track of and then we have more of a barren landscape. Do you work at all or do you hear from code compliance about um, those kind of cases and do you consult with them and you know what's happening there? I know that code compliance has been asked to look at businesses and making sure that they're um, keeping up with their landscaping. And, and that's a good point. I do talk to code compliance quite a bit. Um, they have, you know, sometimes it's very evident and they're going out to properties and businesses. And, um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes they have to, you know, provide them information about they need to replace some of those trees. Um, sometimes I'm asked to go and also consult and make sure that there are some issues, what's going on. Maybe there's some alternatives that the business can use. But um, that's something that you were talking about budget. What I'd like to do coming this year is um, a little bit more on the code compliance, because that is something that we do need to really focus on. Um, we're not looking at disposable landscape here, and that seems to be a tending, uh, trending tendency. Um, we want something more sustainable. So we want to provide people good information on species selection when they're submitting their plans as well as how to care for them so that code compliance doesn't need to come knocking at their door. Right tree, right place. Right place. So um, I know that only a third of our bus stops are shaded. And because where bus stops are, they're often on arterial roads or roads where there's a lot of utilities right on directly underneath. And that prevents maybe some sometimes prevents trees from being planted, but then there could be other kinds of shade structures. So do you work, how do you work with other city staff in trying to increase the shade canopy of transit stops that are that can that can actually take trees um, where it's actually okay and you know, easement problem. And, and, and that's a very common concern as you get the built environment increasing. Um, especially like in the downtown area or any type of urbanized area. Um, natural shade is not always the most appropriate shade. That's why it's called a tree and shade canopy, because we have to use the combination of engineered shade as well as natural shade. So I do work with transportation. Um, we've got a number of ideas and designs that are coming forth that, you know, provides shade structures, as well as sometimes we can use smaller statured trees under power lines. To me, a tree is a tree. So it doesn't have to be a very large, big shade tree. It can still be a smaller structured canopy tree, but if it's placed correctly on the right aspect with the sun angles, you can still provide pedestrian shade at bus shelters or even along sidewalks or bike paths. So it's very important to remember there's the combination of the two, and that's something that, yes, we are working with all the time to just make sure that we're providing that shade throughout um, our neighborhoods, our transit routes. 
Thank you. Yeah, I'd like, you. To, yeah, I'd like to see us. Oh, sorry. Keep having that issue. I would like to see uh, us approach businesses and have them adopt a tree or adopt a bus stop and be willing to to look at that particular bus stop and see what can be done with with manufactured shade, with man-made shade or a tree, because it's going to benefit that business to have a shady transit stop. It's going to encourage people to to come to that business if they can wait comfortably and be in the shade. So I think there's room where we can have some private public partnerships. So, um, so uh, I have a question from Deb Zinja. And she asks, what is disposal landscape? Deb, is disposable landscape. Um, that's something that, you know, I've worked with um, a number of professionals and there's actually, we put an article out about this um, many years back and I've kind of adopted this term here for the desert. Disposable landscape. If you look around here in the valley, um, not just in Tempe, but just around the whole Valley of the Sun, Landscapes seem to change about every 10, 12, 13 years or so. And people change up their plants or the wrong plant was died, uh, wrong plant was planted and it didn't make it. And so we just put in another one. So there's nothing sustainable about that. So the whole idea is to try to get away from this disposable landscape. Okay, well, I'm going to keep it for four or five years. Well, I planted in the wrong place. The tree got too big. Now I'm going to cut it down because it's too close to my driveway and I'm going to plant something else. Uh, we need to be a little bit more thoughtful in our species choice and our location when we're planting. So we don't have disposable landscape, but more landscape that stays around for 25, 30, 35, 45 years, which is sustainable here in the desert Southwest. Hopefully that um, I made that distinction for you about what disposable landscape is. Thank you. And we have a question for David. So Kowalski, David, do you wanna speak? I think you can speak here. Yeah, sorry, I didn't wanna interrupt. I heard you talking about the bus stop shelters and the trees. And I was wondering, I've actually been in a situation where I was waiting underneath the tree when there were birds there and realized that I didn't really want to wait there. So I was just wondering, like, is there any consideration as far as the type of tree that maybe might, you know, do some bird, some trees attract birds more than others or any kind of consideration for that? David, there's always the consideration for that. I have to look at all the locations in the areas. I look at the attributes of each of the trees and make sure that I have a growing space available and then that always works into the tree selection. Um, some plans get out there. Perhaps I hadn't had a chance to look at them. As um, the council member said, I've only been here for what a year and nine months. Okay, so we're trying. We're, we're working through that and trying to correct some of those problems. I also plant trees for wildlife. So, um, and I can really feel for you by a tree full of birds standing at the bus stop waiting in the shade. Not always the pleasant experience. I think we've all been there. Um, I have the same issues with the ficus trees along Mill Avenue. Um, a lot of people love these big stature crown stick trees. There's one thing that likes to sit in all that big protection of that tree, and that's a lot of birds. And so, and you know what comes with that. So the, the short answer to that, yes, that is a consideration um, on the species that we choose. But then again, I try to work with managing the wildlife and the tree and the people all together in the urban environment. And that's what makes it called the urban forest, right? Okay, the final question. I'm gonna channel my inner, inner Oprah Winfrey and ask you, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? Well, there's a couple of answers to that. It depends on where I am in the country. If I am on the East Coast, I would be an Eastern hemlock. Suga camadolensis. Absolutely fantastic old growth up in some of what we would call a holla. Um, up in some of the valleys in the Appalachians. Fantastic. Out here in the desert Southwest, a desert ironwood. That is by far my favorite tree. It has beautiful blooms that come late spring, those little P-shaped flowers, 
produces a wonderful little seed. It's a little nut that if you harvest those when they're just slightly starting to turn brown from green, blanch them for about 45 to 60 seconds, and then peel those open, put some chili pepper or some salt on them, better than peanuts. Absolutely fantastic. Desert ironwood, very nice wood, great woodworking, very strong tree. Um, that's what I would be here in, in Tempe. I fully expected an answer, and that's amazing. <laughs> well, we so appreciate uh, the, the expertise and the enthusiasm and everything you bring to the city of Tempe. I am so pleased that we have an urban forester. The only, only, are we the only city in Arizona that has an urban forester position? You can just nod if you don't want to. <laughs> No, as a, a designated urban forester, Tempe is the only one in the state. Well, thank you. Thank, thank, you, you, so thank you so much for being here. And uh, we hope our trees make it through the summer. With your great advice. Your great advice. So thanks. Well, so I thank for you for the I thank you for the opportunity. It's great to be here in Tempe, um, working with the urban forest and helping it to move forward and achieve that canopy goal by 2040. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'm going to introduce our final speaker. We leave save the best for last. We I want to introduce Braden Kay, who's our director of sustainability. He's been with the city for four years, I think, almost five years. Four, four and a half years, yeah. <laughs> oh, and uh, well, I have to talk about you a little bit, Braden. So you can put your you can put your screen off because you'll be so embarrassed about me bragging on you, but. Uh, uh, Braden is our first sustainability director. He's also one of the first graduates on a PhD program in the School of Sustainability. And he has also worked for the city of Orlando. He came to us from the city of Orlando at one point, sustainability project manager, and has worked. He's directed research and community engagement for reInvent Phoenix. He was the director of arts and facilities way long ago in Chicago, but has an incredible um, resume. And he also is an active member of the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. And from what, from what you told me, it was so crucial to get a director of sustainability to be eligible for grants. And I know you've done so much work in helping to plan strategically how that Urban Sustainability Directors Network has proceeded. So we thank you for that. But um, Braden has been such a wealth of information and resources to departments across the city. I just think of the of the new fire station and, and how we didn't have to go out for a consultant. We had Braden, an in-house consultant, to advise us and to try and bring more sustainability uh, practices into the building of that, our very latest building. So, and you work across so many diff different departments, energy, transportation, water, waste, uh, land use, food, housing, social issues. And more than anything, though, I like to say that your contribution has been to um, just to show us all that equity is the most important part of the three E's, economy, environment, and equity. Equity is so central to our sustainability efforts in the city of Tempe, and that is one of your greatest, greatest contributions. With that, I would love to hear what's going on in your world and sustainability, uh, not just in, in, in Tempe, but maybe in the state, because I know you're seen as a leader in the state, so you can maybe branch off um, and, and talk about that as well. Thank you, Brayden, for being here tonight. Thank you, Councilwoman QB, and uh, just a, a huge thank you to you for for your leadership. Uh, so much of uh, what everyone's seen tonight, Sustainability Commission, Urban Forester, Sustainability Office with the Sustainability Director, uh, would not have been possible without Councilwoman QB, QB's leadership. So uh, just really grateful to to all of your your work and, and your continued leadership in sustainability and, and resilience. Uh, and just want to acknowledge, uh, so awesome to have uh, Richard, our urban forester, on staff. It's been so much fun uh, to get to work with Richard, and you can see uh, why he is—he's really a national treasure, uh, one of the one of the best urban uh, foresters in the country. And that that we get to have him here in Tempe, uh, we're just so lucky uh, to have his expertise and his his leadership. And and as you can tell, there's a lot. We see a lot of programs in cities that are just about numbers of trees. And to have someone like Richard that understands 
it's about the quality of the trees you're planting and the and the quality of your operations and maintenance program to make sure you're maintaining the trees that you have. Um, you know, it allows for a fiscally responsible and ecologically responsible approach to urban forestry that I'm just so glad that he's brought to Tempe. I also want to thank Kendon Young. Um, he's really not only defined what the Sustainability Commission is in our city, but he's defining what it means to be a high quality uh, board and commission chair in our city. Uh, he is um, helping other boards and commissions understand the kind of role that they can play in the city of Tempe and uh, just really grateful for his leadership first as, as a vice chair and now as the chair of the commission uh, and uh, his ability to help support other board and commissions. It's just been amazing to watch his leadership over the last several years. So, yeah, what I want to talk about tonight, and we can leave it mostly for questions, but I, the major theme that I want to talk to you about, and, you know, one of the things that, that I, I think is really important is as a sustainability program, as we've been growing a sustainability program in Tempe for almost, I mean, we've been growing a sustainability program in Tempe for about 15 years. Um, you know, the work of uh, sustainability champions, both on council as well as sustainability champions within the city government and sustainability champions in the business community and among residents has been vibrant for many, many years. But we've had an official Office of Sustainability since 2018. Um, I've been in the city manager's office for the last five years. And I think the first several years were about sort of let's get our first climate action plan on the books. Let's get our first renewable energy goal on the books. Let's sort of start the, the bread and butter of, of getting this program started from a city perspective. Now, the work we're really trying to do is figure out how can the city meet the movement that already exists in Tempe. And so it's so important to understand the most, some of the most inspiring things happening in our city are happening because of entrepreneurs. They're happening because of students. They're happening because of residents. They're happening because of activists. And it's up to the city to meet the energy and the drive and the vision of the movement for climate action and the movement for sustainability that already exists out there. And I, I've been guilty of this myself. I think it's possible that when you first start a program of sustainability in the city, you put a lot of time and energy into the city sustainability work. And that is important. We need to walk the talk and we've been making sure that we're investing in the sustainability of our own city operations and we will continue to do that. But as we build a, a world-class sustainability program in Tempe, what we really need to invest in is we need to invest in our community, in the existing movement, in making sure the existing movement has additional resources. So I just want to give you tonight a few examples of what that kind of community investment uh, looks like. Um, so one of those investments, uh, Councilwoman QB uh, referred to uh, equity in action was an innovation project uh, that we married with outside funding from Vitalist found uh, the Vitalist Foundation, our local health foundation. Uh, we we basically created a coalition of ten uh, community members who wanted to us to help us rewrite our equitable engagement practices to make sure that we were centering people of color and centering marginalized voices in our community. We now have a draft framework. And we have those community members are working on pilot projects to help shift the culture of how we do engagement in our city. So that was one example of we had we took a city investment, we doubled it, we then had a hundred and fifty thousand dollar investment in changing our engagement practices in our city. It was one of the best funded uh, sustainable, equitable engagement. Uh, practices of any city in the country, especially of a city of our size. And that's the example of this flipping of the script of how do we get money in the hands of the movement, in the hands of community members uh, to help drive an agenda that works for the movement, not necessarily an agenda tailored to the needs of, you know, bureaucrats or elected officials. Uh, so that was one thing, one, one, one example of this. Another uh, example of this is ah 
we just, as part of the COVID relief funds, were able to fund a energy equity um, and climate justice initiative. So we did listening sessions last summer with youth and with business community and with um, our climate justice community. And what we heard was, hey, you have a real opportunity to work with community-based organizations uh, to do that deep listening and that deep partnership. And government is not only the is not the only answer to working in deep partnership with the community. There are community-based organizations that are an expert at that. And you should give them the keys, let them do the talking, let them do the listening, tell them what you want to know from community members about and and politely step a little bit aside. And so we're now uh, in partnership with Unlimited Potential. They did an amazing job of helping run our first uh, Dolores Huerta uh, Climate Justice Training Day uh, two months ago. And they are going to be working in the Victory Acres, Escalante, and Gilliland neighborhoods doing that door-to-door, community center to community center, deep work. They're going to be teaching about energy bills. They're going to how to read your own energy bill, how to save money on your energy bill, how to get through the summer, either through your air conditioning or your swamp cooler or different ways to low cost get through a hot summer um, to really make sure that community members are frontline communities that are getting hit first and worst by extreme heat or have the resources they need. They're also going to make sure that those community members know how to approach council, how to approach the Arizona Corporation Commission, how to approach the SRP board with their concerns to make sure that the concerns of uh, of those neighborhoods are being heard by the halls of power to show that climate justice and energy equity need to be uh, more on the front front of minds of, of our city leadership and our utility leadership. So that's another way that we're flipping the script. A third way we're flipping the script is this program I'm really excited about. It's a grant that we got from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to continue our work. We've been doing cutting edge work with uh, researchers at uh, Arizona State University and about six or seven different schools across the university on how to support the city in becoming more resilient to extreme heat. Uh, we've gotten a variety of grants over the last five years from the National Fi Science Foundation, Pew Charitable Trust, um, the county, um, in a variety of places. And we we built that momentum to apply for the cool kids, cool, cool futures. And I believe Kristen's going to be here with us. Uh, the video that we showed for Dolores Square today um, that explains the cool kids project. Are, are you able to pull that up, Kristen? Hopefully, yes. Hopefully, you'll all be able to hear this. Hi, I'm Braden Kay, Sustainability Director for the City of Tempe. We're here to talk to you about an exciting opportunity that we have called Cool Kids, Cool Places, Cool Futures, where Tempe youth can catalyze climate action in our region. How do people in your life talk about heat in Arizona? In Tempe, when adults uh, hear how hot it might be in the coming decades, many of them say, well, I'll be dead by then. Or they say, well, we'll move if it gets that hot. Young people in Tempe tell us they want to stay here, and they know they need to make it cooler in order to live healthy and productive lives. The Phoenix region could face upwards of 40 to 50 days over 120 degrees. If young people want a vibrant economy and healthy lifestyles, then young people need adults to change their behavior now. Research from ASU shows there's a potential to invest in urban forestry, green buildings, cool materials, and low carbon tr transportation. We might be able to limit the extreme heat average increase to two to five degrees instead of the increase that may come of six to 12 degrees if we continue business as usual. This shows that our efforts to cool our region can have a lasting impact on our economy and health. Heat does not have equal impact across our city. Shade is often in wealthier neighborhoods and Tempians with less resources often have less shade and less access to air conditioning. This makes extreme heat a social justice issue. Heat is also a racial equity issue. 
as black and indigenous residents of Maricopa County have higher death rates from heat. Cool Kids has partners on board to ensure we center people of color and indigenous concepts of resilience as we address extreme heat. This project is meant to shift power and give voice to the next generation of leaders that are demanding we build our city in ways that center youth, racial equity, and indigenous perspectives in order to ensure that we're tackling injustices in our current built environment and creating a more cool and inclusive Tempe. We're gonna give you a brief overview of Cool Kids, which is a two-year project meant to support young people in Tempe to combat extreme heat. Hi, my name is Nicole Huser, and I'm the Community Resilience Coordinator with the Cool Kids Project. Cool Kids is based on two youth councils with 10 students each to focus on urban cooling and climate action in Escalante, Victory Acres neighborhood and the Gillian neighborhood. Tempe's Mayor Youth Advisory Council has a long history of making change happen. Cool Kids is building off of this important legacy. Cool Kids is designed with resources to support youth councils. ASU researchers and student fellows with experience in racial equity, indigenous concepts of resilience, planning, emergency management, design, and sustainability will be available to the councils. City staff, including community development, transportation, community services, sustainability, and human services will support the work, including Tempe's new urban forester and emergency manager. Councils will also be supported by social workers, local teachers, and artists. Cool Kids will strive towards cooler neighborhoods, a better city, and hopefully will help cool Maricopa County. Projects will include communications and arts projects, cooling projects like food and forests and native gardens, and guidelines for the city on how to invest in urban cooling. Cool Kids aims to create local solutions. And we are inspired by global ideas. Karina Kwame uses art and jazz to tackle climate change. And Dan Neely's team is building community resilience from the ground up in Wellington, New Zealand. Dan and Karina will be available to support the cool kids to ensure that we are centering creativity, equity, and community voices in our work. Cool Kids aims to flip the script from top-down emergency management in order to support youth in developing grassroots community resilience right here in Tempe, Arizona. We aim to change our region's approach to heat. We need to move from only investing in reactive actions like distributing water bottles to collective action, including building food forests and doing more neighborhood outreach. Thank you so much for joining the Dolores Huerta Climate Justice Training Day today. Please consider joining Cool Kids and please let eighth through 11th graders that you know about the opportunity to apply. Thanks for in indulging me in watching that. And uh, um, yeah, that that's the theme of the day is, is flipping the script, getting resources to youth, getting resources to organizations, getting resources to neighborhoods. I know that we haven't been doing that as much as I would have liked in the first four years of our program. We are building momentum and building the resources necessary to do more of that uh, community-based and person-to-person -person work. And I'm really uh, proud of our efforts to, to move resources in, in that direction. And with that, I'll take any questions anyone has. Thanks so much, Braden. I know we don't have a lot of time left, but wanted to ask you about climate stories because that's an unusual way we're engaging with our residents on climate, a climate crisis and climate action. So I'll put the, um, the link in the chat while you talk about it. That would be great. So we partnered with uh, Dr. Marta Burbis and Dr. Lauren Withacombe Keeler. We worked with Dr. Ke uh, Keeler on our first climate action plan, and we decided uh, to work again with uh, students and professors from what I call future school. They call it the, the school for the future of innovation in society. Um, 
and we develop we we developed some engagement strategies. Uh, the main one being uh, climate stories, and so we have four parks in Tempe, uh, Kiwanis, Papago, Clark, and Escalante, where you can visit for the rest of the month and read two stories about uh, climate action in Tempe, and then you're able to text us back uh, reactions to that story uh, that give us more information that help are helping us build the next climate action plan. The online, for, we have an online forum that has the same stories that you can do uh, to also give us feedback on the climate action plan. So um, really excited. It's another excellent example of how, how the partnership between the city of Tempe and ASU can produce new ways of, of doing work. And uh, hopefully uh, you can get out and text us some some feedback and some of your ideas via the climate stories. Yeah, I don't think there's a, a week that goes by and even though I'm not physically at ASU in my day job, I'm online uh, where someone doesn't contact me from the university and saying, I have this great idea. And I, I know there was a Charlie Rolski who works a lot in plastics and microplastics has an idea for recycling plastic. And I'm eager to hear about that at some point, but I also want to let people know that that online forum, it's also asking about livability. What does a livable community mean to you? Now we formed, we're doing business in a new way on the council. We used to have working groups on individual little projects or possibilities of projects. And now we have these giant committees and uh, council member Jennifer Adams and I chair a committee and then Corey Woods is the floater. And um, we are focused on sustainable and livable communities. So we wanted to, at the beginning of our, our tenure here, looking at a lot of issues, just ask people outright, like, what does livability mean to you? What my definition is, it might be different from others, but there are also some common values that we have in Tempe. And one of them is shade, wanting shade and wanting equity, but I won't give away the, give away the stories, but um, we also encourage you, there's a link in the chat to go to our online forum and give your feedback because we really wanna look at that and see what what people want us to do in the city, because ultimately the best projects that, that I know I work on, they come from resident input. They come from input from ASU students and faculty. And I know um, you've been the master of bringing the university into our process. Like there's a pipeline of ideas and projects coming into the sustainability office from, from, from ASU. And I just wanna ask you sort of maybe one final question. How do you do it, Braden? You know, you're, a one man office, you sometimes have interns, you sometimes get positions for a year or temporary time, but how is it that one person can encompass sustainability work at, at this level and at the city? Well, it's really a team effort. I mean, all of, you know, the, the mayor and council have been supporting sustainability, uh, really excited about the upcoming budget this year. Uh, hopefully there's additional investment both in our capital improvement budget and my hope is also uh finally funding a second <laughs> member of the office of sustainability fingers crossed um so and there's a lot of city staff you know that aren't in the office of sustainability that are our partners in transportation like richard in in um community services in community development in human services so one of the things i am proud about is that i do think that the sustainability is is moving into the culture across the city. We're seeing such an exciting project for human services this summer. They're creating a new resilience hub called uh, Temp Envision Tempe. That's going to be a resource both for extreme heat days in a cooling center as a one stop as well as a one stop shop for workforce development and job training. That is in its heart a sustainability investment, but it's coming from the human services department. The human services department is also working on this mobile uh, cooling uh, station that uh, Councilwoman QB can tell us about. That's very exciting. That's a human services solution. So part of the reason we're we are being able to survive off of such a strong office is with a lot of support from a variety of partner, uh, departments, including Grace Kelly uh, in our engineering and transportation department that does all of our energy work. So uh, it's been a, it's been a lot of work, but there have been a lot of people involved. I also have to give another shout out to the Sustainability Commission. You know, they really set the vision and the tone. Uh, sometimes I, I I do tell them, hey, one person, we got to go a little bit slower because uh, I can't keep up. But uh, but it's been really awesome to be able to have such a 
a full community from elected officials to the sustainability commission to all the city staff to business partners and the residents we did another really cool thing we now have the office of sustainability has hired an intern that's embedded at the tempe chamber that's going to be working with the chamber and local first on the business agenda for our climate action update uh, so we're 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 making sure that we're taking advantage of all of the resources at ASU, uh, additional grant money, and then all of the partners that we have throughout the city. So it's been it's been a fun ride these these last five years for sure. And I know sometimes in cities they like to see uh, return on investment for this dollar you're getting this much back. And sometimes we're I think sometimes sustainability in other cities can be tagged like that that you have to somehow show that this is savings. Now there, we know there is. We know we save energy, we save water, but there's all these um, there's all these benefits, side benefits like building community. You can't necessarily give a measure to building community. You can't necessarily give a measure to equity, right? So um, I think it's important to know that. Although you brought in what 2.4 million dollars in grants since you yeah, it's, in the city, it's, so it's it's about 2.4 million, and and we're seeing. I, I just wanted to take an opportunity to answer an earlier question. Chandler is doing its first municipal sustainability plan. Scottsdale is doing its first municipality municipal sustainability plan. Mesa has made a commitment to a climate action plan and is doing their first municipal sustainability plan. Peoria is doing their first municipal sustainability plan. Phoenix and Tucson are doing their first climate act, official climate action plans. So we're starting to see Sedona is doing their first climate action plan. Flagstaff already has one. They're now doing a carbon neutrality plan in Flagstaff. Yeah, wow. So we're we're starting to see a lot of movements uh, uh, across the state of of doing really exciting work. I, I would say, one anyone you know here tonight. Obviously, you're a devotee of sustainability and a devotee of Councilwoman QB. Uh, but hey, one of the best things you could do, and this is how it got started in Mesa. Mesa is partially doing a climate action plan because young act young people in tempe sent our climate action plan to mesa youth in mesa saw that climate action plan and said we want one of those and now that they went to their council members they demanded that climate action and it's happening there and and one thing i will tell you is tempe cannot do this alone we have to have cities across the valley and across the state invested in this not only can you support our sustainability program if you have friends in other cities send them our climate action plan tell them that this is possible that they just need to be reaching out uh to their elected officials and to city staff this is a movement that's building a lot of momentum and it's not just about talking to your neighbors in tempe but it's about talking to friends and neighbors throughout the state that this is something that we should be investing in statewide hallelujah brother <laughs> in the words of lynn manuel miranda it's it's a movement not a moment and you prove that more than anyone. So thank you so much for being here tonight, Brayden. Thank you, Richard Atkins, Mr. Tree, Mr. Desert Ironwood. I'll never think of you in the same way ever again. Um, and Kenan, thank you so much for your dedication. And we'll be signing off. Happy Earth Day, everybody. I hope you get out and get out in the green tomorrow and you spend a weekend hiking and restoring your soul. Check out Sing Meadows. It's such a beautiful restorative place in our own city of Tempe. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.